guys for coming today. Uh, we're really excited to have Pete. Um, his work sounds really fascinating to me, um, and I'm really excited to hear what he's going to talk about today. Um, so just to give you a little background on Pete and his work, um, he is a software and firmware app developer, um, and he focuses on developing scripts and bots for VR systems and game engines. Um, and currently, at the moment, um, he's working on industrial robotic training apps for VR and AR. Uh, so I'll leave it up to Pete, and we're excited to hear what you're going to talk about. Hey, can, uh, can everybody hear me? Put me emoji or raise your hand if you can hear me. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to talk about spatial computing and robotics. And hopefully everybody knows what spatial computing means, but if you don't, it means uh, anything where a computer knows where it is in relation to other computers or other people or other things. So just let me uh, peek down out from my headset so I can advance the slide here, okay. So first, a little background about me and, and who I work for or with, uh, I work for a company called FS Studio, and uh, they do games and simulations. Um, they used to be much more uh, game oriented and much more mobile games like smartphones. But uh, lately, we've gotten uh, we've gotten to do more toward uh, industrial simulations that aren't really games. Um, I got working with them because I'm a, a Unity developer. I've been uh, developing with Unity since version three. Uh, and uh, some of my early stuff, I'm just gonna go over and get the laser pointer here. It's just easier for me to point things out. Um, so yeah, I'm a Unity developer. And I got started with them uh, because I'm a Unity developer. And uh, one of my first gigs was to uh, work for FS Studio to help develop software for uh, the Leap TV. I don't know if any of you are aware of a company called LeapFrog. They make uh, children's toys. They had a device called the Leap TV, and uh, this this part of the device you see here is a wand that you could un unroll and you wave it around, and your camera on your TV would see where the wand is. So even this first engagement with FS Studio, there was some spatial computing involved in the sense that. Uh, the, the device knew where the kid was. This was uh, due for exercise and, and to play games with. Um, and then some of my next engagements with them were with the Z-Space device. I don't know if you're familiar with this device. Was uh, it's a, Basically, it's a computer that's made for the educational market. And it has cameras and sensors in it. And it can tell where your head is because you're wearing these glasses that have uh, little markers on them. And you have this stylus here that also had a little marker on it. So as you're looking at this device, uh, also it, it has polarized lenses. So this is a, a stereo monitor. So you see a 3D image, but it also knows where your head's moving. So as your head would move around, it's tracking your head and it would move the content around to give you parallax. So again, it was also a spatial computing uh, device. And I didn't realize until I was preparing this slideshow that even these first two engagements had elements of spatial computing involved. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide here. So yeah, everybody's aware of oop, mixed reality and virtual reality involves spatial computing. But there's also a, a whole bunch of stuff that involves spatial computing that isn't mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality. Robotics involves a lot of spatial computing. Uh, in particular, smart cars. So everybody's aware of smart cars. They have to know where they are. They have to be able to scan in front of them, tell if there's people, um, even a home robot. I have, uh, I'm on my third Roomba. Uh, and my current Roomba that I have actually does uh, it's what we call SLAM, which is uh, simultaneous localization and mapping. But it means it's, it's, it's got cameras in it and sensors in it, and it's looking at the environment, 
mapping the house so that it knows where to clean and where not to clean and where it can go and where it can't go. And, and actually, where, am, where is it at a given time? So robotics and spatial computing, um, or sorry, uh, mixed reality, virtual reality, the stuff that we're all familiar with, as well as robotics, both involve spatial computing. So that's because they both, they both involve awareness of your environment. And because of that, um, spatial computing is sort of the, the place where robotics and, and virtual reality can meet. So now I'm going to get into some examples of, these are all projects that we've done um, for, for companies that involve robotics and, and virtual reality or spatial computing. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a simulation of a, of a drone that we did in VR. It was done in desktop VR. Um, and we had to simulate machine vision, facial recognition, gesture recognition, and collision detection in the, in the virtual reality version of this drone. So why, why did they want to do that? They wanted to shorten uh, the time to market. So they had the plans for the drone ready, uh, but it takes at least six months to get the drone made overseas. And in that six months, they would have been sitting there doing nothing really. But because we were able to do a simulation of the drone, they were able to simulate the behavior without having the hardware. Um, they were able to tune the physics, um, determine if their battery was going to be big enough. Um, they were able to see the animations that their artists did uh, so that the, the drone had a, a display on its face and they had a bunch of animations um, that it would react to various things that would happen. And we were able to sort of do that in virtual reality so they could actually see what it would look like. Um, they also had some special behaviors that they wanted to simulate. And in virtual reality, we, we simulated the ability for the drone to see your face just by doing ray casts to, to, the, to your head and, and your eyes and your mouth in virtual reality. Um, so that we could do these behaviors, like there was a peekaboo behavior. So if you, if you basically take my hands and I go like this, that would, we would detect that and the drone would do this, this pirouette maneuver that they wanted. Um, so that was a, a while ago that we did that, and recently uh, I revived that code and I, I updated it for the Oculus Quest. So the main reason for that was just to play around with uh, what, what could be done on the Oculus Quest, but there is also um, the Oculus line of virtual reality headsets. They have a, uh, an SDK for social presence, for co-presence. Co they have uh, avatars in there. There's, um, there's a virtual reality library called Normcore that I wanted to play with, and I wanted to play with uh, voice over IP. So I did an update of that, and I think the next slide might be a video. And there it is. So hopefully you can all see this video. This is a virtual reality version of a drone that this is the Quest version that I was just referring to. Um, so one of the cool things I like about this is the sound. So th th this, this is actually simulated right down to the physics of the props. Um, so we could actually change the size of the props, it would get more lift. If we change the, it's it even simulating how much battery power is being used. So we could uh, change the, the size of the battery, it would, it would go longer. Um, but the sound, I'm really proud of the sound because it actually sounds like a real drone and I've got, I've got a bunch of drones. And so uh, another thing you notice is that when I put my hands close together, 
I get the controller, right? Now watch when, I, when my hands come apart, I get this point at the ground thing, and when I put my hands together, I get this controller. So that's another sort of spatial computing thing. It's the context, the context of where are your hands, hands in relation, in to, each relation to each other, where are they in relation, to, in your relation to your head. There, we don't we show don't it show here, it but there was, a, there, was a, there was a mode there was where a if you put your hands up to your head like this, like this, you would be would looking be through looking the drone's through point, the point of view. Point of view. Um, so, um, so I, I, I like things like that in spatial computing. So if any of you have ever used Google Earth VR, you know they've got a globe on your hand that shows you know a street view of where you're at. And if you actually bring that globe up to your face, you stick your head in that globe, you're actually in street view. So that's that's a spatial computing thing. I, I really like spatial computing uh, apps that use contacts like that. Don't get me started talking about Half-Life Alex. Any of you, any of you played Half-Life Alex? One person there, two persons, three persons. If you get a chance, play it. It's even if you don't like the genre, it's, it shows you a lot of the kind of things that you could do with spatial computing. So I think I probably missed showing a bit. There was, there was one point where I pressed a button and the drone actually starts to look for your face and comes over and hovers in front of your face. So that was another, there, nav mode. So it's about to come over and look for my face. And now it's tracking. You can see down there it said tracking. And hopefully you can kind of hear that humming, the humming noise. And that showing you, there's the, that's an Oculus avatar that uh, it was one of the reasons to play with this was to see how the, uh, the avatar SDK works. And now another feature of the Oculus avatar SDK is uh, the ability to invite someone into your app. So there's an, uh, my friend is in the app there with me. It's, it's not alt space by any means, but it's, it's pretty cool that we can, uh, we can build apps like this where other people come in. And for this particular, uh, for this particular drone application, because it was a company that was trying to visualize what the drone was gonna look like beforehand, this sort of thing where you can invite somebody to come in and you're both looking at the drone and you're both flying it around or you can both see how it performs. Um, this, is, this is very much the future of uh, collaboration for a lot of uh, industry. So there's, there's that drone subject taken care of. So the next, uh, the next project I'll talk about is, is there's this fetch, fetch robotics robot. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen one of these, but this is a very common robot used in, in warehouses and factories. It's called the pick and place robot. So um, you teach the robot about the environment it's in, for example, a warehouse. Um, so it has kind of a map of that. It's got sensors on it for uh, figuring out where it is in that space. And um, you typically tell it, I need you to go get this from over there and bring it over here. And it's got this arm on it uh, um, so it can go to where you asked it to go. It can pick something up with the arm, put it on its base there, drive over to some other place and either a human or some other robot can take that and then ship it out in an order or something along that line. So this company wanted to use these for, um, um, they, they wanted to be able to take these and, and put them in a house so that if, if there was an elderly person there, this sort of a robot could be their home robot and go to the kitchen and, and do various things to help them. Um, so <clears throat> we, we basically wanted us to simulate different rooms, basically have a randomized room that they could then simulate 
how easily it would be, how easy it would be for this robot to navigate in, in a random place. Uh, so we did this with a desktop VR system. Uh, we simulated the a LiDAR. So down at the base there, it's got a, la uh, a laser beam that scans back and forth, and that's how it knows, you know, where the where the walls are and where obstacles are. And up in the head, it also has another LiDAR, so it can determine how far away something is when it looks at it. And it's got stereoscopic vision, so it can do sort of 3D depth perception as well. Uh, it runs uh, something called ArtWeb's robotic operating system. Um, we used IK or inverse kinematics to be able to grab or, or move the hand and have the arm figure out how to bend the elbows and such so that the hand is where we want the hand to be. Um, and the cool thing about this was we used uh, a force feedback device which I think is in the next slide here. I'll just go to the next slide. So yeah, this thing down at the bottom is called, a, a, I think it's called PetchX um, haptic controller. And <laughs> very few people have used them because they're very expensive. But I'll tell you, this, this device is so freaky because you you program, you tell the device about your 3D environment, and then it will actually push back when you try to do something. So you move the, you see the person's got the stylus there. When you push forward, if there's if there's a cube there, you can actually feel all around the edges of the cube, and it's very very convincing. So we used it to. Um, so, so the way you would, the, what you would do is you would, we have this, um, the robot, you would sort of drive it around as though you were sitting in it. Um, you would go up to some place where there was an object and then you would reach forward with your hand and the arm on the robot would mimic what your hand was doing. But if you hit an obstacle, uh, it, it, you would push back at you. Um, so that was, that was a really, one of the more interesting things about this. Um, next slide here. So that kind of led us into doing this other project, which is a, a, a complete simu another simulation of, a, of an environment for a robot to be in. But in this case, the robot is the forklift down at the bottom left there. Uh, um, and the idea is to simulate a warehouse visually and with the collision meshes so that you can use machine learning to train a neural net uh, on how to navigate through your warehouse. And that neural net would be transferred to one of these robotic forklifts, which would then be able to navigate around the warehouse. But it's sort of a circular thing. It's like SLAM. Um, the forklifts have cameras on them. So as they drive around the warehouse, they're constantly taking photos of the warehouse, which get fed into the system. Um, so that if things change in the warehouse, the model changes. Um, not instantly, but, uh, you know, without much lag. So... And I think I just basically told you about everything on this slide, except for, so 3D segmentation is, is important nowadays. 3D segmentation is, segmentation in general is looking at a picture or something and figuring out, for example, if it was 2D segmentation and you, and you did, a, and you scanned a document, segmenting would be going, this part is an image, this part is text. Um, those are pretty much the two things you're really concerned with a two, with a 2D document. So 3D segmentation, what we really want to do is where are the walls, where are the floors, where are all the permanent things, and what are all the things that are going to move around? Like you want to sort of build a model of the warehouse, but you want to remove the pallets because they can move. 
Um, because what you really want to know is where is the physical parts of the building. So, next slide. Okay, so this is a video. This is a, this is a video of the simulated warehouse that would be used to train the, the, uh, to, for the machine learning part. Um, and one of the interesting things about this is usually in games you're, you're interested in speed and you're, you're cutting corners and you're not trying to be realistic. With this, we're trying to be as realistic as we can be, even to the point of, uh, you know, um, uh, dust and stuff in the, in the, in the room because that's what the that's what these robots are going to encounter in the real in the real uh, warehouse so again so it's continuing on with the robot uh, the fetch robot stuff um, when I got a magic leap I wanted to do something with it so I figured I would take the fetch robot and put it in the magic leap so it's just really, uh, this project is just sort of a sandbox for me to play with the Magic Leap, see how it works. Um, but the important thing about the Magic Leap is you wear the headset, you walk around the room, and it creates a mesh of your actual environment. And that allows you to do things that seem to interact with your, with your actual environment. Uh, so... I bought the I bought this fetch robot model into the Magic Leap, and the cool thing about that is, you can now see if the robot fits in your real environment. You can now have the robot sense a real environment, um, determine you know I I want to go over there, but there's something in the way, and you can go around that sort of thing. You can uh, do things like walk around your room, point at the floor, drag out a square and say the robot should never go in that square, or maybe that's where the robot has to go to char recharge, that kind of thing. And it was a really fun project. So I think there's next, there's going to be a video in the next slide. So here we go. So that's, yeah, what you're seeing is I'm grabbing the control panel uh, and I'm going to walk over to where the robot is and put it above its head. But you can see that it's video of, of my actual living room there with a virtual robot in it and this control panel with a bunch of buttons and readouts and stuff. But there's the robot and the red beams are simulated LiDAR. Um, where you see I'm highlighting, there's a, a, an area, there, there's part of the robot body is highlighted in red as I point at the robot at different parts of the robots, different parts of it highlight. Um, so when I point at the bottom, the control turns the robot and moves it forward. If I point at, uh, at that part of the arm, the control will control that part of the arm. So each part of the arm has two motors, one at the back and one at the front. So it, it kind of worked out great, pretty good. Um, and in a second here, you'll see I'm going to go up and I'm going to say zero and the robot will go to the zero position. And then there's another button I go up and I say go to the uh, stowing position and it moves its arm back. What you don't see here is the ability to actually walk up to the robot, put, put the controller near its hand and press the button and then I I can pull that arm around wherever I want, and in inverse kinematics, it will it will put the hand where I want the hand and adjust the rest of the arm so that it's uh, you know it puts it puts the arm there, and then I can say okay, record that step, and then grab the hand, move it again, record that step, um, so that you could sort of do a, a sequence of moves where. Uh, it has to go go over there, pick that up, then go over here, put it down, that sort of thing. So that was that. So once I had that, and of course, while I'm on the subject of Magic Leap, uh, we had, uh, at one point I did uh, a bunch of 
courses for Coursera. So we, uh, we did three courses for Coursera on VR, two, two of them were on VR and one of them was on AR. And we made these, uh, this fun robot and a bunch of um, tools for your hands. So we had a sword and we had a pistol and we had a, uh, a so, you know, one of those uh, punching things that was on a scissor thing that extends. You'll see it in a minute in the video. So we had all these assets from, from that. And uh, I got the magic leap. I was looking for things to do. So I, I, um, I built this thing. And the cool thing about this is the gesture recognition, uh, which again is a spatial computing thing. So uh, you'll, you'll often find at the, the root of uh, anything that involves machine vision possibly has a spatial computing aspect to it. Um, and I'd say gesture recognition has a spatial computing aspect because it's, it's a machine sensing its environment. Where is your hand? What shape is your hand in, etc. So I think the next slide is just a video. So I'll just show you that. Okay. So there's the punching bag and you notice it's in the same environment that last robot was in. So when I press the button, that boxing glove is going to extend on a scissor. It's kind of fun. And what you can't see here is, is the mesh, but obviously there, the, uh, there you go. There, there's the mesh. That's the mesh of the Magic Leap has created of, of my living room. Uh, and now you, you're probably gonna see the gesture. So I'm gonna stick my hand up there and I, and I do um, a flat palm and it gives me this Star Wars kind of a sword. And you'll see again, I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna I do the thumbs up, or the finger pistol, turns into a gun. And then I think I'll, I'll do a, I'll go back to a sword again in a second here. Or no, the punching bag. Yeah, if I do a fist, it turns back into the punching uh, thing. So that's, uh, that's all fun with, with spatial computing and uh, the magic leap. And uh, so another magic leap thing, um, <clears throat> uh, everybody knows what a Roomba is. The company that makes it, uh, they have a, actually a really cool device called the Create. And it's a, it's a Roomba that probably got broken or warranty or whatever, but they refurbish them they give them a, a new faceplate. They're pretty cheap. They sell them for, I think, maybe $200. And it has a serial cable on it. So you can actually, uh, through the serial port, you can read all the sensors. You can tell it to turn the motors on and off. So basically control a Roomba with whatever you want. So <clears throat> I, I hooked one up to uh, a Raspberry Pi. Let's go to the next slide here. So yeah, I I uh, hooked I hooked a ra there's the crate that I was just describing on the right, um, and on the left is a Raspberry Pi. So I a Raspberry Pi is a very small uh, microcomputer that has Wi-Fi. It's it's small, but it's it's got a good amount of power, um, and so I hooked this Raspberry Pi up to the crate through the serial port. Uh, put some big, big lithium ion batteries on that so that it, it was uh, move around on its own. And then on the mag I, I wrote a little web server that runs on the Raspberry Pi that I could have a Magic Leap app over Wi-Fi tell the um, tell the Raspberry Pi what to do. So what I was trying to do was have the Magic Leap because the Magic Leap has a mesh of the room, I was trying to have the Magic Leap figure out 
where the Roomba was so that it could actually tell the Roomba where to go over to a certain spot. Um, now, it, it didn't work that well uh, because it was <laughs> the mesh that the Magic Leap creates of the room includes the Roomba. So the Roomba is actually a lump in the mesh and that kind of threw a, threw a bit of a, a loop in the works. But it did work well enough to the point where you could actually drive it around. So let me uh, go to here. So here's a video. That's what you see through the Magic Leap. <clears throat> you see this, uh, you know, the, the representation of the Roomba with the little red things are, are the sensors. That's the Raspberry Pi sitting there, and that's the Roomba. And what you can't see is that I'm moving the control around, uh, moving my, sliding my thumb around on the control to make it go. They don't have much video of that, but that was kind of a fun thing. Uh, and again, it's spatial computing. Um, it's what I see. It's what the magic leap is, is uh, seeing. It's doing a slam. It's creating a mesh of the room. And I'm trying to make the Roomba know where, where the mesh of the room is th through, the, through the magic leap. So it's sort of indirectly. So now there's the one last project that I didn't have a lot to do with this, but the other folks at FS Studio did have, uh, and that's this motion simulator, which is you, you basically, you wear a VR helmet and they play back 360 degree video that was captured from a drone. And at the same time, uh, the drone, they were capturing the video from a drone they're also capturing motion capture data because the drone has an IMU on it, so it knows when it's being tilted and when it's moving. And uh, you put all these things together, there's another video coming up, and you get this. Oh, okay, so yeah, it was created for a big client, um, motion capture from the drone. Uh, something interesting was they took the motion capture data converted it to a sound file and then used uh, uh, sound apps to manipulate the data and then wrote it back out. Uh, and yeah, when you put it all together, you get this. Oh, by the way, there's a big giant robot in this. So the guy in the chair is seeing 360 degree video from the drone and he's moved the motion of the platform back to what the drone can do. So that's probably one of the, the more fun things that, the, that they, we've ever done at, at, at FS Studio. And that's pretty much it. So hopefully I've convinced you that spatial computing and virtual reality and augmented reality um, all work hand in hand with robots. Is a, I guess we'll do some questions now. Awesome, Pete, thank you very much. Um, Everybody, please give Pete a round of emoji applause. And I'll come up here. And what we're going to do, this is what we usually do um, at XR Creators, is uh, after, the, after Pete presents, we're going to open up the question and answer section, session. And Hello. Uh, hi. Hi. This is the first time I've come across the XR creators, but that was a great presentation. I loved it and I love the stuff you do. So my question is just kind of, you know, up in the air. Uh, so I, I, I do more stuff more professionally, like 3D modeling and stuff. And I love the idea of present, I love the idea of presenting 
like the stuff that we make to our clients in a VR, you know, headset that they could just slap on and they'll be able to see exactly what it looks like in the virtual sense. Uh, but there's almost uh, just a question of like, what's the advantage of doing that as opposed to just putting it on a website like Sketchfab and then sending them a link to that and they can just view the 3D model? Like what's the advantages to doing it in VR? Do you think it's going to be dependent on the type of client you have for well, it, dep the... it, it does depend on, uh, on the specifics of the application, but for the VR drone uh, version, we actually simulated the physics, we simulated the sound, we simulated the look. So yeah, you probably can't get that, um, you probably can't get the same feel you would get on a website as you do standing there. For example, it, it would the, the the drone was supposed to uh, detect your face and come up and fly a certain distance from your face but how far should it fly from your face was you know there's a question of safety you don't want to go in like right up right up in their face but um, you don't want it too far away and you you really can't judge that very well from just a 2d um, a 2d portal looking at it um, it's also mm -hmm. difficult to how, like if you're on a website, how do you how do you um, control whether you turn around? So if this thing's supposed to detect your face, so it come up and detect your face. So in VR, it's easy for me to go like this and see if it can find its way over here. But in 2D, how do I make the controls of even a gamepad or a keyboard? How do I do that with a, a gamepad or a keyboard? In VR, especially in, in room scale like this one was, you can just move somewhere. I can just walk over there and see if it follows me. So that was a big advantage for, for that particular one. Um, the last one I showed you, the motion, uh, the motion control thing, that was actually a location-based VR experience um, that it wasn't the drone. I can't mention their name, but you know, if you, been to a big places in California or Florida, you might be able to guess who it was for. Um, and you can't do that. It, it, it's hard to simulate that in a web page. You really do need to have that big giant platform there and get in it and feel, wow, this is really, you know, this is really doing what I'm, uh, what I wanted. You know, I, mm -hmm. just being able to turn your head to, um, look at a different spot um there there's there's no match for that with just a 2d website mm -hmm. okay i mean i have like another question if i can ask that it's okay uh, yeah go for it i'll leave that okay there's just the other uh product where you could like detect the spacing of the room and you could then interact with objects and stuff in that room you know if you place them that was during like the punching uh, part where you were able to have the virtual object interact with the real environment as if, because it's been simulated. Uh, do you think there is, you know, more advantages to looking into that technology to try and figure out the spaces that it almost can't see? So trying to interpret, you know, between the chairs of the legs, not just the block that is the chair, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, though that's that's depends on uh, on on how long you take to scan it. So with the, with the magic leap in particular, um, it will refine the mesh if you uh, look at a certain spot in more in more detail, or if you linger over it longer. Um, for you know, you only need a certain level of, of resolution for that to to work for a lot of use cases. Um, in the case of the for the fetch robot, so for the client, we actually modeled the room, and and I, I there was a progression there of the first first stuff that we did with a fetch robot, and then we progressed to um, trying to trying to do photogrammetry and segmentation so that we could automatically figure out where the room was and where the contents of the room was and distinguish between them, um, but that. That stuff is costing companies a lot of money uh, to do, um, to train, to train uh, 
robots or to, to manually create CAD that represents their warehouses or their locations. So there's a lot of interest in using photogrammetry for it, but even that is <clears throat> it's still very expensive. You, you've got systems that <clears throat> they bring in uh, radar or LIDAR based, uh, um, they sort of look like uh, surveyors, theodolites, and crime scene, crime, crime, crime lab, crime scene people will use them. They bring them out and they scan, do a 3D scan, they get a huge point cloud of uh, uh, the particular crime scene, but it's from a specific location and it doesn't know, you know, this is the actual road, this is a car that's on the road. <clears throat> so there's a lot of money and research going into that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to give Todd another chance here to see if his microphone's fixed. Oh, there is that better? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, too many Zoom calls, and it was defaulting in my desktop mic. Uh, Pete, uh, great presentation. Uh, definitely gave me a lot of ideas, and I, I learned a lot. Thanks. I'm curious about using virtual reality as an interface, a telerobotics interface, to control robots. For instance, um, do you think it's possible sometime in the future when we do have uh, global access to the Internet and VPN connections to have something like a VR console interface on an island, like in the middle of Indonesia, controlling a robot around the world, like, you know, someplace in the United States where somebody could, like, assemble a watch where you have that level of precision haptic feedback. Yeah. And do you think that's possible sometime in the future? It, I do, absolutely do, and you just sort of twigged, uh, I've thought this for a long time, but I have this vision, for example, of let's say you're, you work for a hydroelectric company and the hydroelectric company has 30 or 40 remote sites that are hydroelectric dams. Um, so if, if they put enough cameras in them, and more importantly to me, if they put microphones in them, then you should be able to sort of sit in a control room and go, oh, well, how's, uh, how's substation number six doing? And remotely visit substation six uh, and even sort of walk around, even though it, there may only be five or six fixed cameras, maybe we can interpolate between those cameras so you could be at any position in the room you want and it'll synthesize a view of that for you. Or maybe we've got little micro drones that can fly around the room uh, mm -hmm. to be where you are. But what I, the point I want to make about that, that I, that I keep trying to make is, um, captain on a ship, there's visual and audio, right? A captain on a ship knows if there's something wrong with his ship because it doesn't sound right. It's not because he looks and there's, oh, I look, there's something wrong. It's because he, he sits there and he goes, something doesn't sound right with the engines. So, what I want to see is those microphones in those in those substations because they're going to tell you, you know, that it's it, it's a bad sound when something goes wrong with machinery. It's often the sound that that is the first clue. So absolutely, I think even if you just had that without the visual stuff, even if you could just go, what does it sound like at substation six today? Uh, and that could be automated. Machine can can do that. A machines can monitor the sounds, and the machine can go, "Oh, hey, uh, boss, something weird going on with substation six. And then the the operator goes, "Oh, yeah, something doesn't sound right there." You know what I mean? So absolutely, I I, I think that's going to happen more and more in the future, and uh, I I'm there for it. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. I should have snagged the picture before everybody took off as soon as the Q&A uh, session started, but go ahead. <laughs> In a minute, we're just going to open it up for everyone anyway. Um, if everyone wants to jump up on the stage really quick, um, we'll have the camera capture us. Let me make sure we can get on the stage. Todd, I don't know if you want a different slide up there or anything, or if you just want to leave the conclusion one on. Just go, uh, 
No, that one's pretty good. Okay. Sums it all up. Hi, Hi. everyone. Hey. So everybody is, um, everybody's up on the stage. This gray robot directly in front of us is uh, filming us. So go ahead and do a bunch of emojis, whatever you want to. Wave to the camera. <laughs> awesome. All right, so that pretty much concludes the um, session. And uh, feel free to mingle and do whatever for a few minutes. We're open for another few minutes and we'll hang around. But thanks everybody for showing up. We really appreciate it. Hi. And thanks, Pete.